Hi, my name is Valerie Leonard. I am the founder of Nonprofit Utopia. I want to say welcome to you this afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us and taking time from your busy schedule to, you know, at least stop through. Um, before we get started, if you could, uh, wherever you are, leave your name, where you're from. If you have any questions, um, please feel free to post and um, I will answer any questions as we finish. All right. So we're, we're going to take about an hour. So it might um, be about 45 to 55 minutes before I can get to your question. But by all means, post any questions or comments that you might have. And again, introduce yourself. Tell us where you're listening from. All right, as you may or may not know, this month we're focusing on policy advocacy in the nonprofit utopia community. All right, and today we're gonna to talk about affecting change through policy advocacy. And our first session is going to be focusing on what you can do at the community level. And Sharif, I'm so happy to see you. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope you can stay the whole time. If not, this video will be available and I'll make sure to tag you, you know, once we're done. Again, thank you so much. Sharif, as you may or may not know, is the CEO of Bethel New Life here in Chicago. I'm just gonna share Sharif's photo. Hey, Sharif, thank you so much for joining us. All right, and without further ado, I am going to share my screen. And again, I invite you all to uh, let us know where you're listening from. If you have any questions, any comments, you know, feel free to share your experiences in policy advocacy at the community level. All right, and just bear with me, I want to make sure that I have the, the right tab for you. All right, so we're going to be talking again about affecting systems change through policy and advocacy. And today we're going to focus on local community action planning. Um, Sharif has a lot of experience in affecting change at the local level as well as at the city level and probably even beyond that if i if i remember correctly so sharif please feel free to comment as you go along and before we start i uh, just want to give you a little bit of information about nonprofit utopia our mission is to develop the next generation of ethical nonprofit leaders and we provide ongoing professional development and networking opportunities in which experienced nonprofit professionals can share ex their experiences with the next generation of ethical nonprofit leaders. I'm sorry, I had to take a little bit of time to make sure that we're still um, plugged in, don't wanna run out of juice. And the overarching goal of our community is to give our members the tools that they need to develop strong organizations that will make a lasting impact. So in summary, we are working with our members to develop their leadership skills as they develop the capacity of their organizations to make positive change. And our vision is to strengthen the global nonprofit sector by training over 50,000 people between now and 2033. If you want to find out more, go to nonprofitutopia.mn.co. And a little bit about myself, I specialize in community and organizational development. I've been at this for over 30 years in one form or another. I host the Nonprofit Utopia internet radio show as well as these live streams. And through Nonprofit Utopia, I provide consulting as well as coaching and an online community for emerging nonprofit leaders. I also teach courses at UIC in nonprofit management, as well as courses at Roosevelt University here in Chicago, working with folks who want to start social enterprises. And I've got a master of management degree from Kellogg in marketing and finance and a BA from Spelman College in economics. 
And just so you know, we want to just share with you what our definitions of advocacy are. We all have different definitions, but I want to share for our purposes a common definition for advocacy. And for our purposes, advocacy is taking a stance in defense of a person, a population, an issue, or a cause. And we know that as nonprofit leaders, you're doing that all the time. When we talk about case advocacy or case work or case management, we're looking at solving one person or one family's or one community's problem at a time, right? So we're bringing together a project manager who pulls together a team of people who can address a series of problems. So for example, in this case, um, if Abu Mar's family doesn't have potable water in their home, we work with the local authorities to address the problem for his family and his home. And this example is, you know, an international example. We may not all have this problem, but this is one example. And when we speak of issue advocacy, we're talking about raising awareness around a broader problem or an issue. So we're not just talking about individuals, we're talking about issues that might occur in our, our communities, our cities, our states. So for example, if a local community does not have access to potable water, or if domestic violence is not being taken seriously by the local police, we launch a publicity and activism campaign around these problems to draw attention to the issue and ideally not just draw attention and make a lot of noise, we wanna create change. And when we're talking about creating change, we're talking about systems change, change to policies, change to laws, change to practices. When we talk about policy advocacy, we're talking about a solution-based um, approach. Instead of solving a problem for one person at a time or simply raising awareness in policy advocacy, we analyze the causes of a problem and then we develop policy-based solutions. Again, you know, these are solutions that are rooted um, so that we can make systems change, long-term change to address these in a manner that causes sustainable and endurable change. So formal policy mechanisms include things like laws, government regulations, government policy and practices. You know, those are key areas that we want to influence change. And this work often seeks to alter the way that official institutions address or spend money on the issue. So you're not only looking for a solution, you're not only looking for changes in the laws, you have to make sure that whatever changes you're advocating for are actually funded. Otherwise you end up with what we call an unfunded mandate. Whereas, you know, the government says that this is the law, but if they're not appropriating or providing the money to put some teeth into the law, all you have is a nice, pretty law. All right. So if you look at this diagram, this shares the basic four functions of policy advocacy. Uh, first of all, policy advocacy aims to change official policy, legislation, or regulations. It also endeavors to implement long-term sustainable solutions to our problems. It incorporates best practice on using evidence, research, and developing policy. So when we talk about evidence, we're talking about um, things that we can prove. And usually it includes data. It might include case studies where people have actually made some improvement as a result of some solution. And it also involves both lobbying decision makers and mobilizing citizen audiences. So uh, I just want to make a point here that it is legal for nonprofits to engage 
in lobbying and lobbying is advocacy where you're engaging with the legislative branch. You can also engage with um, the heads of um, different agencies, the heads of your government, such as your governor, such as your mayor. That's not considered lobbying, but it is considered policy advocacy. Um, people who are department heads, you know, people who make decisions. So you want to be able to influence people at all levels, and not just your policymakers, but you want to also influence people on the ground, you know, so you can make sure that they are aware of the issues and so that they can help you, right? So here are the eight components of policy advocacy, and I'm going to try to enlarge this so that you can see it. And this is a chart that we read from the bottom up. So your basic level of advocacy is starting with delivering services. So if you are a nonprofit organization, you're already in the advocacy game because you're delivering services and uh, also programs. Another part is raising awareness of issues. And then the third part is building capacity. That is making sure that you have the systems in place so that you can engage in policy advocacy. Also make sure that people who are helping you can engage. And then after that, you're mobilizing and influencing populations. And then after that, you get to a point where you're actually developing policy in hopes that your elected officials can carry the water for you. And after that, you're drafting legislation and legal strategies so you become closer partners with your elected officials. So you participate in the drafting of laws that will actually make a lasting change. After that is advancing legislation and national strategies. So again, you're working hand in hand with your elected officials, and then you're tracking and evaluating the results. Because remember, it does no good for you to um, make changes in laws if you're not going to follow up, right? So typically speaking, our elected officials, just like for us, we tend to be more inclined to do what's inspected rather than what's expected. So it's not enough to just get these changes passed into law. It's um, incumbent upon us to be vigilant and make sure that these laws are being passed as we intended. All right, so some of the reasons why policy advocacy fails. First of all, Failure to research the issues and analyze the impact. You know, so remember when you're engaging in policy advocacy, it's a game of strategy, right? So you want to make sure that you know the lay of the land, know who the players are, know what the alternatives are. Um, another reason is lack of understanding of the difference between lobbying and policy advocacy. Again, you know, lobbying is making sure that you're engaging your elected officials who actually write the laws. Policy advocacy is engaging people at a number of levels to influence change, you know? And again, we just went through those eight phases of policy advocacy. Poor planning, uh, probably that should be number one. Poor execution meaning that, you know, you might have a wonderful plan, but you don't go about executing in a way that's effective. Um, advocacy is not prioritized. You know, you could work in an organization where the priority is providing um, programs and services, which is not a bad thing, but you got to make sure that as you prioritize your services and programs that you're also uh, prioritizing your advocacy. Because in many instances, especially a few years ago here in the state of Illinois, we had uh, a very hostile environment for nonprofits. And if your organization wasn't engaged in advocacy, 
in some cases, you just closed down because you didn't really prepare yourself or engage. Another problem is inability to frame issues in a way that's easy to understand. Policy advocacy, as you know, is a very complex process. There are a lot of moving parts and sometimes the language that you might use with your legislator might be a little bit different from what you might use with your colleagues or people in the community. So you have to get to a point where you know your audience, who to speak, you know, how to speak to them, how to speak in sound bites, right? Um, another problem is failure to get buy-in from major stakeholders. You know, you've got to make sure that you're not in this by yourself, that you can actually engage people who are going to be impacted. Another problem is the inability to get your message out. And another problem is lack of understanding of the power dynamics. So as you go through your policy advocacy campaigns, it's really important to know the lay of the land. It's important to know the power structure and where different um, points of influence are mm. that you can impact. Um, another problem is lack of understanding of the legislative process, right? Which is usually a very success. So it behooves you to be a student of the legislative process, either at the city level, the county level, state level, federal level, you know, know who you should engage at what points. All right. So the focus on this presentation today is going to be on the bottom four rungs. And then we're going to be using as an example a UNICEF local plan of action process. Even though this is a process that is done for developing countries around the world, I find that this model is very applicable to the work that we're doing here in the United States, particularly in communities that are undergoing change. So for our purposes, we're going to be looking at the Local Plan of Action or the LPA for children. And this is a strategic document whose goal is to create and improve children in accordance with principles set forth in the Convention on the Rights of the Child, World Fit for Children 1, and National Plans for Action for Children in Serbia and Montenegro. Again, this is a model. Um, as you listen to me go through this, I think you'll find that a lot of these lessons learned can be easily applied regardless of where you are in the world. And particularly if you're doing business in a developing community, right? And when I say developing community, I'm talking about a community that has been under-resourced for a while and now it's coming up, right? So the LPA, or the Local Plan of Action document defines short-term, mid-term, and long-term measures and priority actions for the period 2005 to 2010. Again, this is a case study. The overall goal is to create an environment that stimulates development of children and youth, creates the, the conditions for their active participation in the life and work of the local community. And again, you can apply that to any place, right? So the LPA for children is not a goal in itself, but an instrument for exercising the rights of the child and improving the position of children in local communities. And the LPA is an instrument by means of which it is, it is possible to ensure an equal treatment for all children, and it play, pay special attention to discovering marginalized groups and ensuring respect of their rights. Again, that's very common here in the States. So in this example, the government of the Republic of Serbia adopted the National Plan of Action for Children in February 2004, and the government of the Republic of Montenegro did the same in April 2004. And accordingly, on one hand, LPAs are based on key principles and components of the National Plan of Action, whereas on the other hand, they are coordinated to adjust to the local needs and priorities. 
So the main principles of LPAs are to reduce poverty among children. And likewise, you want to uh, reduce poverty amongst any clients that you serve. Um, you want to make sure there's quality education for all children, better health for all children, improvement of the position and rights of children with special needs, protection of the rights of children deprived of parental care, protection of children from abuse, neglect, exploitation, and violence, ensuring the exercise of civil rights and respect of children's dignity, and all children are equal citizens. And finally, strengthening the country's capacities for solving children's problems. So this may be a specific LPA specifically for children, but regardless of where you are in the world, regardless of who you serve, it will behoove you to look at some of these principles and tailor them to your needs, right? So in order to institute the activities from the National Plan of Action at the local level in the first year, um, the following countries or cities were um, selected. So there are several cities, there are three cities whose names I can't pronounce. These are cities in Serbia and they developed their own local plans um, to engage children and their family. So here are the steps that they went through and these were um, at the city level. Uh, the first thing they did at the city level was establish institutional structures, that is, the team who would be carrying out this local plan of action, right? Um, then they gathered data and prepared for the situation analysis, and you're probably familiar with that. Um, what we would do here in the states would be to look at a, a local community needs assessment. Um, then they would engage in initial consultations, then they would develop a draft LPA for children, and then they would get feedback for the draft, and then they prepared the final version, and then they would establish and maintain a database, and then they would monitor and assess the implementation. All right, so... Um, in June 2004, UNICEF signed a memorandum of understanding with these municipalities. And during the process, these cities and, the UNICEF, and UNICEF provided the technical assistance in improving LPA capacity, right? And then also the Canadian government. Um, they also implemented this model. All right. So some of the results for the LPA in these five cities, um, the LPA for children has been adopted in all five of those cities and certain priority actions that were envisioned in the L have been included in the budgets. So you see um, where we talked about how important it is to not only develop a, po a policy, but make sure that that policy is also funded by the local government, right? Um, they found that there was good cooperation between all the relevant institutions dealing with children and that there was good cooperation between all of the relevant local actors that includes child care institutions, non-governmental organizations, media, and the local authorities. And they also developed the database so that they could keep track of their work. And it serves as a model for implementation in other countries. I think that this is a good model that can be implemented here in the United States at the community level. And much of what we do too, I, I think can, uh, this can be easily applicable to. So the first thing you do, I think it sounds like common sense, is to develop a team to coordinate the planning process. And one of the first questions you want to ask is who forms the team? So that could be anybody or any group of people who self-select 
as leaders in a community, all right? But you also, when developing that team, need to determine who is the activity bearer. And in some models here, we have in the states, you know, who might be the backbone agency? Who is the money, right? Who is financing the activities? Is it a single organization? Is it a foundation? Is it the government? And another question you should ask is, should the team be an expert or an operative team and the like? So before the team is formed, it's necessary for the person initiating the process to define the criteria for selecting team members. And I will tell you to choose very, very carefully. I can tell you horror stories about not having the right team in place. All right, and then it's also very important that you manage expectations as you go along. Um, from the very beginning, the person forming the team has to give the following information. You know, you have to give the reason for gathering the team and together you can flesh out a mission statement after you had a chance to uh, really come to agreement as to what the issues are. Um, you need to also talk about the results that you expect from the team's work, roles and responsibilities. And I would also include how you're going to hold one another accountable to actually fulfill those roles and responsibilities. You want to give deadlines for implementation, you know, so you want to have for all the tasks and activities you want to assign a person, make sure they're in charge, give a deadline. And then you want to also to identify some of the obstacles and risks. And that would be similar to what we would call in the United States, a SWOT analysis, looking at your strengths, weaknesses, and opportunities in order to do this work. Some of the things you want to avoid when managing the team, you know, um, you don't want to have a situation where certain sub teams have a disproportionate number of members than the other sub teams because one area may prevail over others. And I've had that experience. Um, that was a, a key mistake I made when developing a team. Um, gave a couple organizations um, more power than the others, and that <laughs> ended up being my undoing. Um, so I caution you against that. Um, favoritism towards certain team members, allowing internal um, or personal conflicts between team, team members to fester. So I would advise, even before you get started, to think of um, everything that could go wrong, right? And then depending on whether or not you're starting a new organization or whether this is just a group of organizations you want to come up with some ground rules right and think of everything that could go wrong and think in advance before there are any problems how you're going to deal with that that way it's not personal when the problem happens if you are creating a new organization this would be part of your bylaws and policies if the group of people that are not really a formal organization then you might consider an MOU, right? Another problem is allowing one individual or group of leaders to make the decisions by themselves without consulting the whole group. Um, it's important to make sure that everybody is in on the decision making. When you analyze your partners, right, you want to be able to know, you know, Who's the best fit, right? So you should make a list of all the people and organizations that the goal achievement may affect in a positive manner or even in a negative manner, right? So when you prepare this list and you're not doing this alone, you're doing this as a group, you want to answer the following questions. One, who will gain the most if the goal is reached? Two, who will lose the most if the goal is reached? Um, why? You know, what are those factors that could make people win or lose? And who has the formal power to actually achieve the goal? 
and who has the informal power. So we would call something like this a power analysis, but it's also really understanding you know, who it is can help you, who it is can hurt you. So here is a sample format for your partner analysis. Um, you would include things like the name of the person or organization, the contact details, including, you know. And another thing we need to be mindful of is building coalitions. One, you need to make sure you contact different potential partners and really understand, you know, what's motivating them. And sometimes you'll find yourself working with people that you haven't really worked with before. If you have not worked with people before, I strongly encourage you to do your due diligence. You know, I've been burned by people that I thought I knew. So the risk is even higher when you work with people that you don't know. But the important thing too is make sure you share a vision, share core values, um, and a common way of doing things and have a common goal, right? Right from the start, together with your partners, you need to define formal and informal ways that you're going to be communicating. Because remember, communication is key. And you also need to remember that if people don't hear from you, they're not going to stay interested very long. So you need to get that balance between constant communication. You don't want to spam people, but you do want to keep people up to date on important developments. So some of the characteristics of a successful coalition includes you know, a great number of people. And in this case, since they were dealing with children, you know, developing a local plan for children, um, it should include children and young people. And we should always make sure we're including young people in our plans, but we also want to make sure that we have a broad um, and diverse group of stakeholders. Anybody who is impacted positively or negatively needs to be involved you need to make sure that there's a good exchange of knowledge, ideas, and skills. There is clear division of roles and responsibilities. You know, that might include uh, actually writing an MOU, writing job descriptions, getting people to sign off on them, an agreement, uh, make a good coalition also has decisions that are made, you know, not by one person, but with all coalition partners. And the partners are both people who operate in the field and those who are able to make decisions of importance for achieving your goal. Again, so you're probably gonna need, you know, depending on what it is you're doing, you're gonna need people who are impacted by your service, people who actually deliver the service, people who make laws, concerning the service, people who live in the community where the service is, people who give money to the service, people who regulate the service, blah, 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 okay? So in this case, since UNICEF was working with an LPA, a local planning uh, process for children, and children were the target. So you wanna make sure you, if you're working with children, involve children or whoever your target population is, you want to make sure that your target population and your target population is those people that you are trying to improve life for, right? So you want to make sure you involve them. So at the very beginning of the process, you need to make sure that you organize an informational meeting or meetings in schools where the following could be explained. Okay, so if you're working with children, obviously schools would be a better, a good place to start. But, you know, if you're not working with children, you know, wherever your target is most likely to congregate, that would be a good place to start holding your public meetings. So you wanna talk to them about what the community planning process is, right? Uh, what the goal of your process is, what the stages of the process is, 
what are some of the activities that you envision? And it's important too to talk in general terms so that you're not having done all the planning before you invite people into your planning process, but you do want to have enough information up front so people know what it is that they're getting into, what it is is expected of them. Um, you want to know who the participants could possibly be, how long the planning process is going to last, and how can children and young people or whoever your target audience is, how can they get involved in the process? You know, so all too often we have these planning processes and we plan for people who are not even at the planning table. And that's a big no-no. Um, another way to gather information is to conduct focus groups. And what focus groups are is they're group interviews and you're identifying people in these focus groups who have similar backgrounds, similar backgrounds to your target, similar backgrounds to people who are other stakeholders, right? So in this case, they identify the needs of children and young people because again, UNICEF works with children, but this could be any agency. So you wanna identify the needs of your target market. You wanna identify the problems they have, ways that you can solve the problem. You want to have discussion of various sectoral issues children are interested in. So when we talk about sectoral issues, we're talking really about issues that go across more than one sector. You know, it could be multiple sectors, you know, for example, housing, health and um, human resources and all that stuff. Um, you also want to talk about proposals and suggestions of young people or your target audience, you know, related to this planning process. And then you want to look at your weaknesses, right? Not that you want to spend all of your time focusing on your weaknesses, but you really need to know what they are. So one, you can strengthen them and two, so that you can focus even more heavily on your strengths, right? So once you've formed and developed a team and you've identified coalition partners, you need to identify the capacities required for achieving the goals, right? So you can look at the different types of capacities and resources in three groups. The first group is technical equipment that an organization owns. Um, you can also look at the relevant expertise that different organizations and people bring to bear. And then you can also look at the financial resources, right? And then too, I, I would just add, you know, the community experience that you would have, right? So in order to know what your weaknesses are and what kinds of capacities you don't have, the simplest way is to make a table like this, right? So, in this case, this is not a SWOT analysis. Typically in America, we tend to focus on strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. But in this particular model, the first thing you want to do is focus on your weaknesses. Why? So you can shore them up, right? So in this case, this chart is looking at the specific capacities that are needed, the capacities that they have and what's missing, right? So the plus indicates that they have it, you know, it's strong. The negative, I believe, indicates that, you know, it's missing. And then this what is missing is um, a column where they can go into more detail. All right, so I'm not going to read everything that's here, but for example, you know, they had office equipment, they had a computer and printer, but they didn't have internet access. Um, they had a phone, and then for people, they had a child psychologist, and for sociologists, they had plus and minus, meaning they had a sociologist, but he had no experience 
working with young people. All right, so again, those are just a few examples. And then the next thing you do is build capacity. So given you know what your weaknesses you identify, you want to begin to build that capacity so that it doesn't hamper you when you try to achieve your goals. All right, so one of the first things recommended is exchange of experience with experts and institutions that have the knowledge, experience, and expertise, all right? So the first thing you wanna do is make sure you look amongst your team members and see who has those skills and have them do, you know, in services, you can have skills exchanges. And then after that, if you don't have it within your group, then you begin to look outside the group, seminars and conferences and workshops, et cetera. And then you have to identify any additional training that you might need. And then you also look at hiring experts. And then you wanna make sure that you make the most of your meetings. Make sure that you have you know, very clearly defined meetings. They always start with an agenda. Um, so bef even before you do the agenda, make sure you have a goal of the meeting. So there's never a need to meet just to meet. You know, if you don't have something new to report, there's no need to have a meeting, right? But you want to define the goal of the meeting, um, determine who should be there, prepare the agenda, um, send the agenda to people at least three to four days before the meeting. And then the day before the meeting, check and see if everybody's coming. And I know that sounds like common sense. It sounds very basic, but this is an area that many of us struggle, right? Especially when developing the agenda. You know, sometimes we make our agendas too long, try to cram too much in, or we don't keep our meetings moving, spend too much time on one topic. So be sure to... Um, make the most of your meetings. And then you wanna make sure that you work with your public officials. Um, they could be elected officials as well as people who have been appointed. So um, this could be people who are, you know, it could be an elected official like a mayor, it could be your alderman, it could be your state rep, and again, you want to make sure that you keep them posted on any progress. You really um, also want to um, involve them in the planning. And then, too, you, when you involve elected officials, it's important you have to walk a tight line because, in some cases, the elected officials can hijack your process and it becomes harder to hold people accountable if they're too close with your process. But at the same time, you do need to involve them and keep them um, appraised. So you wanna build a relationship, constantly gather information, offer information. So there's an exchange of knowledge on both sides and you're creating win-win situations. And then you, um, who are not elected officials, you wanna make sure that you constantly lobby or advocate for your cause. So before you meet with your elected officials, you wanna make sure that your team or your coalition agree on what's gonna be discussed. You wanna agree on the agenda and you should be very specific in what you wanna achieve by meeting with people. Again, it doesn't make sense to meet just to say hello or meet just to meet. You want to make sure that you let your elected officials know about your activities, let them know what your issues are. You want to ask for their support. And at this point, when you're asking for support, you need to be real clear about what the role is of the person that you're meeting with. One of the biggest problems that I hear from elected officials is that people come into their office and don't realize what power or what authority that, or even responsibility that they have, right? So you might wanna consider who your audience is. Your congressman can do things, you know, has a different scope from your alderman, different scope from your governor, from your mayor. 
So know, you know, know what it is that they can do for you before you even go in there and ask for their support. And then you want to make sure, you know, especially if there's a differing opinion about how to approach something, you want to find ways of meeting or having common ground. And you want to be able to create what I call triple win situations where the community wins, the elected official wins, and the people that you're trying to serve wins, right? And then you want to make sure, I know this sounds crazy, but arrive at the meeting on time. So during a conversation, you obviously want to be polite, you know, even if you have been angry about how the elected official or who, whomever you're speaking with has comported him or herself or been angry about their position, contain your anger, be polite, um, focus on issues, not actions and personalities. You want to be brief and to the point, and then you want to listen carefully and ideally do more listening than talking. But if you've been um, in a meeting where you're the one who's been invited to do talking, be very clear about what your speaking points are going to be and stick to those points. You want to take notes, um, explain why you might disagree with something. And if there's not a point of disagreement, explain why you um, have a certain position. And if you do disagree, explain why you disagree and why you think your solution is better. And make sure at the end of the meeting, say thank you, leave contact, but don't leave your contact details. But at the same time, you don't want to leave that meeting without knowing what the next steps are. You want to know exactly where you stand with that elected official. Um, you want to know what the next steps are. What is that official prepared to do for you? And if that official is not prepared to work with you, you need to be thinking to what your next steps will be in order to um, either get that person on your side or achieve the goal without that person. All right. So after the meeting, you want to make sure that you let your members know. You want to send information to the official if necessary. And then you want to maintain contact with the official. And again, you want to know what the next steps are with your people. All right. So um, even while defining your goal, you should also think about the time it's going to take. So here is an example of, of how you can go about that, you know, doing a timeline. So you start off with your objective, which is what it is you want to achieve, and then those activities that will help you meet those objectives, who is responsible, what the timeline is and what the results you expect. All right, so when you look at um, the timeline for planning activities for the LPA, remember the LPA, this is a specific model that's used by UNICEF, but it could be applied here in the United States and anywhere in the world. All right, so the first thing you want to do you know when you think about your process is you want to establish institutional structures that is you know who is your team you know that could take up to two months um, another example is you know gathering data and making sure that you have a situation analysis or community needs assessment that could take up to two months um, another Thing you might be engaged in is initial consultation that could take a month. Another activity you could be engaged in is preparing the draft LPA for children that could take two months, um, two months to draft, and then um, another one and a half months to go back and forth and get feedback on the draft, and then another two months to prepare the final version, and then. Uh, establish and maintaining a database for this process and then monitoring and assessing, you know, that would be ongoing. So that 
it would be a typical set of activities that could take you know, up to six months. The types of data that you might consider, you know, first of all, you know, data that's already in your system, you know, that can help you identify where the gaps are, data that already exists on file, but they haven't been entered into your database, data that don't exist in database, but are significant in monitoring. So this might be some data that you collect from, say, a survey or whatever. So this is new information that you're adding and then data for which there are no records but which are very important um, and again you can develop some sort of assessment tool in order to gather those data and all of these different data together will help you to determine whether or not you're meeting your goals and objectives and they'll also help you to advance your your case and when I say advance your case, I'm talking about push for change in the community. So some of the uh, data sources are the Republic Bureau of Statistics and authorized institutions. So remember this model is an international model. So um, for us, it might be the Census Bureau, right? So you wanna, go to the Census Bureau, you know, and gather data at various levels that are impacting your planning process. And then um, depending on who you're working with, you know, other institutions could be schools, hospitals, um, nonprofit organizations. Um, it could be your local state or city. And then you can also collect data different ways. You can collect it through your public census um, and attendance reports, um, surveys, any um, assessments that you might have. And again, your survey methods could include face-to-face -face interviews. It could be group interviews, you know, such as focus groups. It could be a telephone poll, it could be a mail-in um, survey, internet poll, et cetera, et cetera. And you're gonna have various phases of research. Um, the first phase is defining the goal. Um, and when we talk about the goal in this case, we're not talking about the goal of the program, but the goal of your research. Why are you collecting the data? How are you going to collect the data? That's your methodology, right? How are you going to raise money to conduct your research? Then you need to um, determine which research instruments you're going to use, questionnaires, polls, etc. All right. Um, and then once you determine what methods you're going to use, you know, determine who also is going to be collecting the data. And remember, if this is a community process, you might wanna get your community involved in the research, train them in how to read surveys, how to collect the data, and how to do the work in the field, and how to analyze the data. That's one way, that's a really good way of improving community capacity. All right, so, after that, you need to conduct the research and gather all the data, right? So you want to be able to control the pollsters' work, you know, determine, you know, which work, you know, who's actually going to be doing the poll. And then you also have a person who is over the people who do the polls. And then when you collect the data, you know, you want to be able to analyze the data, um, enter the data you know, and then write reports, etc. All right, so we already talked about using and maintaining a database. All of those data should be in a database and you should also document how, um, if you have any uh, calculations or if you make any assumptions, you need to be able to document the methodology. If you have any source documents that you're pulling data from, you need to keep those 
separate as well. So if anybody has any questions, you can always tell them how you got your numbers, where you got your numbers. And if you don't have a straight number to point to, you can at least point to your calculations. All right. So uh, this, <coughs> excuse me, this model is an international model. So they use the Dev Info database, which is a database for people who are working with international programs. And I believe that database is no longer in force and they've replaced it with something else. And we don't necessarily have to focus on that. But when we look at our situation analysis, you know, again, a situation analysis is very similar to what we would call a community needs assessment, right? So you want to be able to, to understand, you know, what's going on in the community. So you're going to be able to collect data that will give you a really good picture of what's happening in the community, who the players are you know, what some of the issues are and how you might consider addressing the issues, right? So these situation analyses, they could be done along various sectors, you know, depending on where you're situated, you can focus on education, healthcare, um, a number of different nonprofit sectors, you know, social services, and um, you can also look at children with special needs. You can look at housing. You know, again, it's going to vary based on what issues your particular organization is focusing on. And if you're working with a number of different organizations, you might consider focusing on different sectors at a time, you know, housing, children, health care, et cetera. Okay. All right, so when you prepare the situation analysis, you know, you need to make sure that you include representatives of all relevant institutions at the local level. So that would be very similar uh, to looking at what we would call an environmental scan. Again, I said looking at the, all the players, looking at the institutions in the community. Um, you want to look at the existing status. You want to do a trend analysis, see what some of the changes are over time. You want to determine some of the main indicators influencing the creation of the trends. So in that case, you're looking at cause and effect, and you want to be aware of the causes and effects of the trends. Why? So that you can develop solutions that actually work. And then you um, develop the recommendations, all right? So you want to prioritize these activities within the capacity of your organization, right? So a group that's just getting started is going to have a different set of capabilities from a group that is started um, by larger institutions, you know, say a hospital and a university. You know, they're going to be able to accomplish more and accomplish it faster than a group of people who are at the grassroots level. But regardless, you know, your priority should be realistic and feasible within your own capabilities. You should comply with your actual capacities and they should be founded on realistic needs of the target group, all right? So you wanna make sure that whatever it is you're developing is actually not only needed in the community, but there's also a demand for it. You know, people are going to use it, right? And then you need to also make sure that your priorities are agreed upon by the, by the group and not just one individual. So some of the ways to determine your priorities, um, you analyze the data and see what trends emerge as a result of your analysis. You want to talk with your uh, target population, you know, whoever it is you're trying to affect positive change for, you need to make sure you talk with them. Um, you need to be able to talk to other stakeholders. Anybody who is impacted by the issue, you need to make sure that you have a conversation with them. 
make sure you also have conversations with people who are in government, who, anybody who can impact or effect change. And also, you know, make sure you talk to anybody who would be willing to fund whatever it is you're trying to do. All right. But most importantly, you want to make sure that the people that you're trying to help are the ones who are driving the agenda. All right. So you also want to make sure you have a table survey of the plan of action. And this would include your goals, your planned activity, the person responsible for its implementation. Again, remember that timeline that I shared and you wanna have a budget. And then you also want to make sure that you include any supporting data. All right. So when it comes to the point of reviewing your plan of action, your local plan of action, you want to make sure that it's discussed by stakeholders. So in this case, it's children and parents who are impacted by your activities. And if you're not working with children and parents, whoever your target market is, all right, you also want to make sure that people who are experts in the area review it as well as the general public. You want to make sure, again, that government authorities community authorities, community residents, uh, representatives of nonprofits, potential donors, and people in the media. So you really want to have your plan inspected by a number of people and you want to get their feedback. All right. So then you want to also um, start implementing your plan. But as you implement your plan, you want to evaluate the process. Don't wait till your plan is um, running full steam ahead before you start evaluating. You want to evaluate early so that you can get some feedback and make changes in enough time to be successful, right? So you start to get evaluation of the process by having people to fill out questionnaires, interviewing each team member, and having a joint discussion. So you want to make sure you get feedback from people who are working with you to do the plan, but you also want to get feedback from people who are, um, I guess, the target of your plan, people that you're trying to help. All right. And over time, you know, after your planning period is up and after you've implemented a while, you might consider getting a professional evaluator. All right. So I know this was a little bit long, but I thought it would be helpful to go through the full process. All right. So are there any questions? Are there any comments? Okay. Sharif, I'm pretty sure you're no longer with us. It's been about an hour and I know you're a busy, busy guy, but thank you so much for um, your comments. You just made my day. Thank you for all you do. All right, so before we close, are there any more questions, any more comments? All right. So there being no further questions, no more comments, I want you to join me tomorrow when we focus on making legislative change. All right. That'll be part two of policy and advocacy. All right. Ah, oh, OK, great. Thank you. Thank you. You're still here. All right. Awesome. And. And just so everybody knows, Sharif is part of an organization. I mean, not only does he head an organization, but he's also part of an organization, Austin Coming Together. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, Sharif, you are a board member and they are affecting change in the process that's very, very similar to this. And they're moving Austin, the Austin community on the west side of Chicago by leaps and bounds through a process very, very similar. In fact, they have 
won awards through their community planning process and they continue to affect change you know at the community level as well as you know making policy changes you know at the city and state level all right so without further ado i am going to stop now and again i invite you tomorrow where we talk about how you can make changes at the legislative level and two you know let you know that you as a nonprofit can get involved in lobbying and let you know what to do and what not to do all right take care bye-bye